Have you ever noticed how your eyes move over a garment or a quilt the first time you see it? I love to find something interesting. This can be an elaborate place filled with buttons or beads, or it can be something very simple. I love to find a little bit of puffing or a lovely hem stitch, or fabrics used in an interesting way on a quilt. We are going to have fun today, and I am thrilled that you're joining me. Welcome to my sewing room. I'm so happy to have as my guest today my dear friend Nina McVeigh. Nina is an educator trainer for Bernina of America. Nina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh my goodness, this beautiful, beautiful christening dress. And I would kind of guess, who did you make this for? <laughs> this was for a granddaughter. For a granddaughter. The beautiful heirloom techniques on the top. And Nina, I love the fact that you've, uh, that you've used pin tucks coming down the dress too. But this is my favorite part. Tell us about this beautiful lace shaping. Well, the Celtic knot on the front is actually a design I took off of my daughter's wedding invitation. I just wanted to incorporate that into the gown itself. What a wonderful memory. What an heirloom. And then the beautiful techniques, including all of the different trims and more pin tucks down the front. Mm -hmm. Sweet, sweet little dress here. Oh, me. This looks like hand embroidery, and I think I probably know better. <laughs> it is done by the machine, um, you know, programmed embroidery. Yes. Really pretty and delicate. Yes. And a little potpourri that matches the dress and has some lavender in it. How sweet. Oh, what a darling little coat. Tell us about it. Well, this little jacket was really a um, an exercise in putting ribbons on uh, the jacket. It, not just stitching ribbons down, but also doing decorative stitches on top of the ribbons, and it really makes a different look on the ribbon. And Nina, I just adore your quilt. And the wonderful Thank news you. is for our viewers, this Thank particular you. quilt will be, Nina will be uh, teaching techniques from this quilt for these next two series, this series and the next one. Absolutely beautiful with your trim in the middle, beads. I love the fact that you've used beads and lots of trims. And tell us a little bit about this. Well, like you said, it's just an exercise in a lot of different techniques, which we will be teaching over uh, the next two series. And so we've got beaded pin tucks, crazy quilting in the embroidery unit, um, some traditional techniques. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. And now we have some techniques to share with you. Going to get to enjoy this beautiful quilt through actually two of our series of Martha's Sewing Room, but I want to show you something very special. This square is absolutely beautiful. It, it has the wonderful uh, stippling and then other embellishments, but here's what I would like for you to enjoy today. The beautiful, beautiful machine embroidery with the little beads and all kinds of embellishment on the machine embroidery. Absolutely elegant. To do this, First of all, you have to do the machine embroidery. After that comes the stippling all the way. And don't you love those beautiful colors, the elegant kind of goldy ecru on the ecru fabric? Then comes the fun part. Uh, the beads and the buttons are, are absolutely placed strategically around on the machine embroidery. Completely beautiful. Look at those delicate little beads. And now, Nina has some real magic to share with you because I think she's going to do all of the, even the beads uh, by machine. Nina, right. welcome to the show again. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. It's wonderful to be here. I really like doing this type of work. Here we have another embroidered design, and there are so many very simple embroidered designs that can be enhanced with adding. Uh, buttons and beads to them. So again, I have embroidered this on my fabric, on the single layer of fabric. And then in order to add the buttons and the beads, I want the stability of the quilted piece. So I've gone ahead and stippled around that embroidery design. And then here we, here we have a piece where I have added those beads. These have all been done by the machine as well as the buttons. So let me show you how we're going to do that. I love it. I love okay. it. <laughs> Let's bring back the piece that I haven't started yet. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to add um, a button to that. 
I'm going to use a button sew on foot and for uh, many of you you have a foot like this and you have a little pin in the middle which is there so that when we sew buttons on for garments they're not sewn on too tightly. When we sew buttons on decoratively you want to remove that little pin um, and on this particular foot I can just push it up and screw it in place. I'm just going to slip that on my machine. <clears throat> I'm going to, on this design, I want to put a button right in the center. And what's going to help me is to put just a little bit of glue stick on the back side of my button. And that will hold it there for me so it doesn't shift when I put it underneath the needle. I'm going to program my machine or select. Um, program sounds complicated. I'm just going to select <laughs> my button stitch, button sew on stitch. And make sure that button is straight to the foot. I'm going to lower that foot over the button and the two little holes I want just right in front of that foot. I like to at this point use my hand wheel just to put that needle in one of those holes so I know that I have this in the correct position. And then I'm simply going to sew. And that's how easy sewing on beads are. This is a set program, so my machine stops when I'm done. I'm going to use my thread cutter. And if I were going to sew on more buttons, I would just continue and put those buttons where I want them. So it's that easy. Absolutely beautiful, fun, and also secure. I mean, it's so nice not to have to do that by hand, I think. It is secure. Okay, here's the tricky part, the part that everybody <laughs> wants to see, and that's uh, putting those beads on with the machine. Now, normally I would use a spring hoop, but with the quilting, sometimes it's just a little bit tight to get it in that spring hoop. Uh, the hoop does keep your fabric taut. The other thing that it does is it acts as a corral for your beads so that when you pour some beads <laughs> onto uh, your fabric, they can't roll on the floor. That's right. Okay. I can sew on as um, even little tiny seed beads um, and a little bit larger. I'm going to use a larger bead so you can actually see it. I'm not using a foot. So I do need to remember to put the foot down even though I'm not using it. And I'm going to lower my needle into my fabric and raise that bobbin thread up so I know where it is. And then I'm going to hold on to both those threads, but I'm going to take um, a couple anchoring stitches. I need to make sure I'm back to my straight stitch. I'm going to take a couple anchoring stitches cut off those thread tails. I'm going to scoot a bead right up to the needle. And again, I want to use my hand wheel to make sure the tip of the needle is in that bead, just the tip, because I can still move this around a little oh, bit to position oh, it. Okay. Then I'm going to lower the needle, raise the needle, move over, and take a couple tiny stitches. And that's flipped that bead over in the direction it should lay, and it's just so that's that one easy. stitch actually one into stitch, the bead. Mm -hmm. So secure. So you don't have to hit the, hit it twice. <laughs> no, secure okay. Okay. one okay. stitch into the bead, move over and secure, and then I can actually travel right along one of my embroidery lines um, to get to the next bead. Well, I have, I don't think I've ever in my whole sewing career seen tiny little beads sewn on by machine. <laughs> so Nina. Cool. Thank you so very much. What a wonderful technique. And now I have some antique techniques to share with you. Victorian lingerie held some of the most beautiful uh, techniques for lace shaping and embroidery. I want to share with you a very special technique from this uh, corset cover. If you will look at the lace shaping it's lace shaped and you can see it flip flops. It goes up and flip flops and it comes down here and flip flops. Very, very easy to do. And then there's a piece of embroidery that has been inserted in behind that shape. Now this is extremely easy to do, flip flopping. 
And I'm going to tell you the secret so you can do it also. One of the very easiest of the lace shapes. First of all, we're going to trace on the pattern on a template, and then we're going to transfer that to our fabric. So you see it's beginning to look like diamonds already, but this is a flip-flop. It isn't a miter the way we do most of our corners on diamonds. Very, very easy to do. I just take a piece of lace. I come down, follow the pattern. Here's the top. I come in. I find where it is, and ladies and gentlemen, I simply flip-flop it. You just turn it like that. That's all there is to flip-flopping lace. All right, I'm going to flip-flop one side. Then I'm going to come in and I'm going to flip-flop the other side. Now you will notice that at the points, one lace, the top lace goes over and this lace goes over. And that's kind of important when you sew it too because you want to follow that pattern. So these pieces of lace come over the top. So when I zigzag it down to attach it, zig and zag and zig and zag, I'm going to come all the way around. Do you notice I did not do anything in the center? Then on the bottom, I'm going to zig and zag. The important thing here is, I want to be sure I stitch in the direction of the lace when I zigzag on top. The next step comes in zigzagging these pieces and zigzagging these pieces. So the top piece really has the zigzag. And when I zigzag the bottom, I stop and then move over to the top. One of the most important things in doing any kind of lace shaping is to carefully, carefully trim from behind so you try not to cut the lace. If you do, don't worry, you can fix it. But the critical thing that I love to tell people about is these wonderful scissors where you can slip it in and you see they have a curve in them so I can actually cut, I can actually trim. Another important thing, they need to have blunt toes on these scissors. That way I can trim from behind so easily and have a really good chance of not cutting the lace. You see these scissors do not have a, a sharp point. Then what do we do to put the beautiful embroidery in behind? It's very simple to do. We come in and then trim away. Let me show you, it makes a little hole. Come in, trim the fabric from behind. And then when I have that little hole, you see I will have the piece, the little lace piece. See, it's just kind of a little square piece. Here, this one is not stitched down. I've slipped the lace piece underneath there, and you already know what I'm going to tell you to do next. You zigzag on the inside, right around that little lace piece. Now, we also have to get rid of those little extra pieces. So what am I going to do? Once again, I'm going to use these scissors, slip right next to it, and I'm going to trim it away. And ladies, that's all there is to making those beautiful lace shapes. And now we're going to have some fun. I have a segment for you called I Love My Serger. So pleased to have as my guest today my very dear friend Alicia Welcher. Alicia is a Martha Pullen educator and she teaches at the School of Art Fashion in Huntsville. Alicia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. And this adorable apron. We have these adorable aprons today, and these are almost 100% done on the serger, about 99.9. Yeah. .9. Look at the little pockets. Uh -huh, they've got pockets. We've got a little bit of heirloom trim. We have to have that sometimes. But the children, this is a beautiful art apron for them. It's got little pockets that they can put their crayons and so forth in, and they take minutes. So what we're going to do today is we're going to show you how to make this particular one here that is on the, the mat here. Um, it is the doll version of the one that you just saw. Now to do this, all we need to do is to take two rectangles of fabric. We're going to put those rectangles of fabric wrong sides together. Then we cut out armholes, not at a very deep curve, just at a very shallow curve. Then you're going to take a three thread wide overlock with a very short stitch length and a decorative cord in your upper and lower loopers both. That cord, once you do the top and the bottom, is going to go on both sides of the, of the apron. Then we're going to take the bottom area here and we're going to fold it up whatever depth that you want your uh, pockets to be. Then you just stitch up the pockets. This is the only sewing machine part. You <laughs> stitch up the pockets and then you're going to stitch the side seams which will hold up the, um, the pocket edges. Then the fun part comes. We are going to bind, you, we're going to use our bias binder to bind the, um, the handles and the, the neck hole all at once. And binders come in a couple of different sizes. There's this smaller size here, and then there's a little bit larger size. We use the larger size on the adult aprons, but then we're going to use the smaller size on the children's aprons. Now the bias binder is this little contraption here. It's um, 
it fits on the front of your serger in front of your foot. And so on this one, when you load this, in this particular case, I have put an S on my bias binding to signify that this is where I'm going to start to load and also so that I know which side is the wrong side of my fabric if it is not very apparent. Now this one, I'm going to load with the S facing me. I'm just gonna push this piece right in here and I'm gonna grab my tweezers and you're just gonna push your piece up into the binder. Push your piece up into the binder. Once it starts to peek out the other end, you just pull it through and it will start to um, fold that fabric for you. Now, every time you do this, you're going to want your first few inches to not be needed in your project because those first few inches are actually going to be thrown away. As you can see, they, it doesn't start to, to fold very well until it gets a few inches in. Now, once you've got that done, you're going to take that piece to your serger and you are going to attach it in front of your foot. Now on the serger here, I have a piece that is attached to my foot. It is already here. Um, it has the binding already attached to it and I've started a couple inches of the binding. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to serge with just the binding and we are creating our first strap. Now I've got a couple of marks on this binding that we're going to come up to in just a second. Okay, my first mark is gonna show up at the beginning of the attachment here. At that point, I'm going to slow down and we're going to keep going until I can see that mark come through right underneath the foot. Then we're going to place the apron underneath the foot and we're going to take the very edge of our apron here and put it right up to the flat edge of the attachment. We're going to push it up into the serger and into the binding until it matches our mark. Then we're going to just keep continuing to serge. We're going to continue and continue. Now, we're going back off of our armhole. We're going to continue again make until we come straps. to our next one. We are, we're gonna make our next strap now. Wow. Continue until our other one comes through. And then we just match up the other side with our second mark. Run that one on through. Keep continuing. We're going to come out the other end. Again, at the end, you make sure that you've got a couple of inches that you don't need as well. And then we come up with this cute little apron. Absolutely unbelievable. Isn't that adorable? So quick so and quick. easy. Oh, mm -hmm. Alicia, thank you so much. You are so welcome. And now we have some hand embroidery to share with you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, my very dear friend, Wendy Shane. Wendy is the designer of Petite Pochet Patterns. She's the author of five books, a regular contributor to So Beautiful Magazine, and a teacher at the Martha Pullins School of Art Fashion. Wendy, welcome to the show. Martha, thank you for having me. I'd like to talk today about hem stitching. And basically, hem stitching was, is also referred to as drawn thread work. So if we look over here at this garment sample, you'll see that there's an open area right along the hemline of this skirt. It gives it just a little bit dressier look. And actually, the stitch is decorative and utilitarian because it holds the hem in place. So let me show you uh, how you would go about making uh, basic hem stitching. As you can see in this fabric sample, I have some threads withdrawn. I'd like to refer to that as the open area. Now, um, it doesn't really matter how many threads you remove as long as you, you know how wide a space you want uh, to work in, and it will depend on the weave of the fabric. For, for you to make that choice. I'm going to begin by working on the wrong side of the fabric. So this is important because you need to prepare for your tie-on so that it is not as visible. Notice I've taken the thread in just along the baseline of the open area. So about one fabric thread down. Now I'm going to hold the thread tail above 
And this time I'm going to bring the needle beneath the, the threads and in this case I'm bundling four fabric threads. Just make sure, I like to usually take my needle and slide it like that to make sure I got the right number of threads that I desire. I'm going to take the, the, the loop down as close to the edge or baseline of the open area as possible and tighten. Now this is called the bundle. The next stitch is called the tacking stitch. It's a two-part stitch. I'm going to take the thread tail and move it out of the way because I want to bring the needle beneath one or two baseline threads um, at the most, no more than two. And this stitch is just going to be a regular stitch. There's no knot or bundle. So you want to hold the thread out of the way. Now the next stitch is going to be the bundle stitch. Under four threads, tighten and pull it down close to the base. And then the next stitch is tack. Now the tacking stitch is being placed right past the bundle. So there's sort of a little open area here. That's where you want to put your stitch. The tacking stitch basically holds the bundle stitch in place or secures it so that you don't drag the bundle across to the next bundle. It holds it down where it's supposed to be. Now this is my bundle stitch. Hold the thread away, take two stitches down, and tack. So you're going to keep going along the hem, bundle and tack, bundle and tack just like that. Now this stitch, like I said, can be a decorative stitch or it can be uh, utilitarian and serve a purpose. In this point, because I am just doing the stitch across an open area, it is decorative, purely decorative. But if I wanted to, I could take my hem, fold it up, bring it up to the open area, and then I could actually hold the hem in place with the tacking stitch. So now I'm bundling and tacking, and I'm tacking only through the hem. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and do a few more stitches because I wanna show you what it looks like on the, wrong, on the right side, rather. Remember, we're working on the wrong side. So you can see, once you get your rhythm going, you can really move through this quickly. I know it's a lot of work, but it's so worth it because let me show you what it looks like on the front. Turn it around and now look at that. As you can see, it's a decorative open area with the set number of threads bundled and the little stitches are almost invisible in there. Now, another thing I want to point out, I'm actually using a heavier thread in a different color. Normally, I would do this in a finer weave linen with an, either a number 50 cotton thread or a number 60. I think you could get by with 60. Now, sometimes you can even use stranded cotton, one strand, of course, and the recommended needle, Martha, is usually a tapestry needle. So really, there isn't much more to show you except how to tie it off, and that's just as easy to do. Go back to the wrong side and just take the needle in through the hem, or if remember, if you're doing it without the hem, just bring it beneath the little stitches in back. That's all there is to it. Wendy, thank you so very much. And now I'd like to share a piece from my vintage collection with you. This little dress is so sweet. First of all, let me just show you the, one of the sweet details. It, ha it buttons on both shoulders. It has two little loops and two little buttons, so you could unbutton it, although I think it could be slipped over the head, but isn't that sweet? The little collar has a detail that I love so much. It has the little hem stitching and then a tiny little piece of lace. All of this has been not hem stitched, but pin stitched. Is that pretty or what? Little release tucks that hold the fullness in for the dress. I haven't counted them, but there are a lot. And then come down to see the details, all hand stitching, of course. The little pin stitch, the little pin stitch and pin stitch, and then the little lace motifs go all the way around, and then beautiful, beautiful hem stitching to actually hem the hem. And I bet you can already guess that the back is exactly like the front. Absolutely a masterpiece of sweet, sweet uh, creativity, and it's lasted through the years and is enjoyed today, even as it was then. Thank you for joining me in my sewing room today. I'd like to invite you to come back next time.